So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Anglo-Turkish Society. We are still, as you see, meeting virtually, but we are talking about how we can meet face to face again. And uh, one of the things that we have penciled in, as some of you will recall, is a, is a nice dinner to start everything up again. But it's just a tad early to pencil in an exact date. But as soon as we have one, um, uh, we will uh, we will let everybody everybody know. I suppose it could be lunch, but the idea is obviously to sit down and talk, uh, which we'll hold at the Athenaeum Club, we hope. But uh, moving now uh, on to uh, today's uh, speaker, a uh, most distinguished speaker with, if I can say, a most distinguished title for her talk, because it looks absolutely, absolutely fascinating. But uh, 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 Professor um, um, Fidio is, is a professor of history at the University of California, Berkeley. But as you see from the flyer, uh, it has uh, extraordinary um, erudite in the different areas that she that she teaches in. And we're very, very fortunate tonight to have a paper entitled Fenerios, Ottoman Governance and the Greek Revolution, New Perspective on Life Before the Tanzimat Reforms. So that's it from me. And we pass over to our speaker who now has the floor. Thank you so much. Um... It's a great honor to be here. And I have presented this work in a lot of different contexts, um, but never an Anglo-Turkish context. And as I went back through my notes and my book, um, I realized that there could be some really interesting new kinds of resonance. So I hope that I hope that, that comes out. And um, I wrote this book on the Fenariots 10 years ago, so it feels like visiting old friends <laughs> to revisit this project. Um, and I'm going to share the screen. Everyone can see. Yeah. Um, so let me just get started. This is going to be sort of, I, I've been told that you've never had a lecture on Fenariots per se in this series. So my goal is a kind of uh, primer on Fenariots, their role in Ottoman governance and um, some other things I'm going to get to. So first, let me begin with the big problems or issues um, in let's say the long 19th century and really in Ottoman history in general um, that are relevant for this. So the first is the role of non-Muslims in Ottoman governance um, and as I'm sure you're all aware, the Milet system is kind of the shorthand way to refer to this very complex reality <laughs> whereby um, non-Muslims, mainly Greeks, Armenians, and Jews were administered according to this loose, um, I hesitate to say federative system, but a loose kind of semi-autonomous um, set up where religious communities kind of administered their own affairs up to a certain point and had limited contact with the central Ottoman state and the kind of military taxation system of that state. You know, we've come to realize in the last generation that this image is um, simplistic, that perhaps it's even an image that was created in the night, an institutional um, image that was created in the 19th century and an institutional reality that was not dispensed with, but actually created in the 19th century more systematically. Um, we don't really understand what it meant, what it felt like, what life, what really constituted the relationships and fissures and disconnects within the scope of Ottoman governance for non-Muslims, um, if we can even generalize, because what I've found even more recently is that really the situation for the Greek, the Rum Milet, right, the, the Greek Orthodox Milet versus the Jewish or the Armenian Milet is, is extremely different within itself. Each one is a different story. But for now, let's say non-Muslims, as opposed to the dominant um, uh, character of the state, which was Sunni Muslim. So that's one set of problems is who were the non-Muslims? How were they governed? What relationship did they have to the whole and to each other? Um, the second problem <laughs> is the problem of the Greek revolution. Uh, which was a turning point for the Ottoman Empire because it was um, it led to the creation of the first successor state based on a national principle coming out of the Ottoman Empire. The Greek Revolution broke out in 1821 um, before the Tanzimat reforms, and we could see that 
in, it was a precipitant in a lot of ways for the Tanzimat reforms that would happen later. Um, the Greek state was established 1828, 1832. It was a complicated story, let's say 1830. Um, and um, that ushered in the, well, it began the process of unraveling of the empire um, that would take a century. There were more Greek Orthodox left in the empire than were in, included in the new kingdom of Greece initially. <laughs> um, this year, this, this topic and this problematic has taken on a new kind of significance and drawn new interest this year, 2021 because it is the bicentennial of 1821, the outbreak of the Greek War of Independence. Um, so for Greeks, so I have actually been presenting this work anew to Greek audiences this year, and it's been fascinating to see the reception. Um, and those kinds of commemorations, the very interesting kind of critical discussions that have come up in Greece around the Greek Revolution, still, um, have a long way to go in really seeing the Ottoman context for what it was um, in 1821. There, it's still, understandably perhaps, very Athens-centric. It still um, is a conversation that assumes a lot of the kind of cognitive and cosmological framework of the nation state before it actually could have existed because we know in 1821 people hardly knew on any side of the conflict where that was going and what the nation state would look like 100 years later. So there's a lot of anachronistic, a lot of ahistorical assumptions going on in that conversation, um, but it's important for what we're going to talk about today. Um, and the third big kind of problematic or rubric is the period of Ottoman governance or the period of Ottoman history um, from the late 18th into the, let's say, second quarter, mid 19th century. Um, it tends to fall between two stools. It is seen as this transitional period. Um, the big the only kind of major book that had been written on it in the previous generation was Stanford Shaw's um, work on the reign of Selim III, 1789 to 1807-08. And the title says it all, Between Old and New. Okay. We don't really know what to do with this period. <laughs> and with even, I would say, sort of from mid 18th century into mid 19th century, it's this slow turnaround or a final decay leading to a resurrection of involving westernization and reforms and modernization in the mid 19th century. Um, it was many decades <laughs> and it also does not really tell us what it, what it meant, what it felt relations, what political, administrative, social relations were in this period beyond chaos and corruption needed to be cleaned up and reformed. So we have these three big problematics. Um, and Fenariots, who I'm introducing today, are and were located at the nexus of all of these problems in history. Um, and what I would like to, to do in introducing Fenariots to you and taking you on this tour through their world and how it came to be and how it changed um, during the time that it was alive, um, is to show you some of the ways that inserting them into these three larger stories, these three problematics of Ottoman and Greek history um, and Ottoman governance and reforms and the Greek revolution actually um, make those stories look different. Um, they don't, I don't think Fenariots solve any problems <laughs> for us as historians, but they definitely, help us think differently about the problems that we have before us in understanding Ottoman history, um, what was driving it, how Ottoman governance operated, the internal logic and the social relations therein. So with that, I open, this is a, um, the image here is, um, yeah, the pre-modern, the pre-Greek pre revolution kind of image of Fenariots. Um, and, I'll be showing you some more modern depictions of them, but you'll, yes, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, let's see. Yes. 
Um, so let me begin. This is Fener, Fanari, the neighborhood in Istanbul that is the namesake of Fanariets. Um, there is the Orthodox, the ecumenical patriarchate of Orthodox Greek, Christ, Greek Orthodox Christians, which is hidden, <laughs> hidden down here behind some of these buildings. This is on the top of the hill is a school, the Megali Duyanusholi, the great school of the race or the genus, um, which was built um, in that form in the late 19th century. But here is Fanar, and let me read you um, the opening passage of the book, um, which I think is nice to have to, to listen to as you look at this image of Fanar Quarter. It was with difficulty that I could collect my scattered senses when the time came to step into the nutshell, all azure and gold, which waited to convey the dragomans suite to the Fanar. Each stroke of the oar, after we had pushed off from the ship, made our light kayak, kayak glide by some new palace, more splendid than that which preceded it. And every fresh edifice I beheld, grander in its appearance than the former, was immediately set down in my mind as my master's habitation. I began to feel uneasy when I perceived that we had passed the handsomest district and we were advancing toward a less showy quarter. My pangs increased as we were made to step ashore on a mean looking quay and to turn into a narrow, dirty lane. And I attained the acme of my dismay when, arrived opposite a house of a dark and dingy hue, apparently crumbling to pieces with age and neglect, I was told that there lived the Fenariot Lord. A new surprise awaited me within. That mean fir wood case of such forbidding exterior contained rooms furnished in all the splendor of Eastern magnificence. Persian carpets covered the floors, Genoa velvets cloth clothed the walls, and gilt trellis work overcast the lofty ceilings. Clouds of rich perfumes rose on all sides from silver censers. The persons of Fenariot grandees were of a piece with their habitations. Within doors, sinking under the weight of rich furs, costly shawls, jewels, and trinkets, they went forth into the streets wrapped in coarse and dingy and often threadbare clothing. So, in the book, I use the analogy of the houses of Fenar to bring the reader into this world of Fenariots in Ottoman governance. So, um, this passage was from a novel written in 1819 by a British um, Sir Thomas Hope uh, called Anastasios, and he had lived in Istanbul and in the Orient, the Levant, um, and had firsthand experience of it. Um, and it is kind of fascinating because it was published and clearly he had his firsthand experience just a few years before the Greek Revolution broke out. So we can see this antediluvian <laughs> depiction, this freeze frame of, of the form, the strange form of power that Fenariots occupied and inhabited uh, before 1821. So who were the Fenariots? Now, in a broader sense, if we're still kind of looking at all of those three problems together, the Ottoman problem, the Greek revolution problem, and this kind of periodization problem, um, Fenariots mean many different things to different people. Um, <laughs> they, within the context of the early Greek state, Fenariots were, um, they were a faction in the revolutionary leadership and in the early Greek state, um, and they were very suspect by the non-Fenariot faction. <laughs> and they were seen as sneaky and secretive and corrupt, um, and very educated <laughs> and very cultivated. And they happen to be some of the people who pervade uh, enlightenment ideas into the Balkans and the Greek world. Um, so there are a lot of conflicting feelings toward this word Fenariots and, and what they represent within modern Greece, even today, as I've noticed in presenting this work to a Greek audience in 2021. Um, they, um, are seen this down in the lower right is um, 
a picture of a, an audience at the Sultan's court um, with European envoys and the Fenariot is a dragoman, right, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, an interpreter, a kind of mediator between Ottoman and European powers um, and statesmen. Um, Fenariots were culturally part of this Greek enlightenment. So they have, you know, separate from their questionable loyalties, they also have this kind of place of honor um, and respect in the larger kind of uh, world of, of Hellenic studies, let's say. In Romania, probably better not to mention the word Fenariots. <laughs> the, um, as I'll talk about in a moment, Fenariots were ruling on behalf of the Sultan and they were very rapacious effectively tax farmers um, and are seen, and, and in Bulgaria as well, they're seen as more rapacious and more oppressive than the, than the Ottoman Pashas themselves. So they do not have a great reputation um, outside of Greece and the Balkans either. Um, so it's a, it is a fraught, it's a fraught term and I'm using it in a particular way, which I'm going to explain in a moment. Um, okay general context of the Ottoman Empire and its expansion and later contraction, right? Um, the Fenariots, I mean, the Greek Orthodox were always there. They were, <laughs> they had been um, the Byzantine Empire before the Ottomans came along. Uh, we now know a lot more about that transition and the phenomenon more widespread perhaps than we had thought in previous generations of Byzantine uh, Orthodox Christian elites and others, military figures being absorbed, converted and absorbed into the Ottoman ruling class itself. And of course, the Dev Shume system. There are lots of ways that there's um, crossover. When we get to the late 17th and into the 18th century, many important shifts happen for the empire. One of them is that um, these Christians no longer need to convert in order to carve out spaces of power for themselves. In an earlier period, um, opportunities were limited. Commerce was always an option. Um, the patriarchate existed, of course, before, um, but um, the kind of complex of opportunities and lucrative <laughs> spaces um, uh, shifted in the late 17th um, century. Um, and thus the phenomenon of Fenariots, the way I define it, is a product of the conditions of governance from the early 18th century it through into the 19th century. Um, what changed, oh, this is a Greek map of the same thing, because I, yeah. Um, and here is a late 19th century, I believe, map of Istanbul, Constantinople itself. And it's interesting, the Fenariot quarter was acknowledged as, a thing. It was it was a significant um, category and concept, um, and and you'll see it is located on the Golden Horn, right? So here's the old city with the Ottoman center of Ottoman governance, government, and the bazaar and the kind of economic and political administrative heart of the city and of the empire. And the Fenariot corner, you know, quarter is there. It's a bit on the margins of that, but it's not over here in Para. It's not. It's not in the Frankish quarter. It is, and, and I argue, you know, and the boat ride that we just, um, that I just read to you about is, you know, going right along here, right, from the Ottoman central state to where the Patriarchate and the Fenariate quarter is. So it is bound up with central power. Um, <clears throat> now, what happened, let me just tell you first about the general shift that I mentioned a moment ago in the late 17th century, um, a couple big determinants of that. Um, one is the cri crisis of the 17th century where the empire was in <laughs> quite a lot of disarray um, from the late 16th into the 17th century. It was rescued, resuscitated, restored by this Kuperlu dynasty of grand viziers. Came from Albania, um, converts in the Devshume system. Um, the empire kind of recouped itself in a very new form, as we know from the work of Rifat Abul Haj and many others, that really it becomes a more bureaucratic and less of a 
a purely military expansionist state, partly because it can't anymore expand. 1699, Treaty of Karlowitz, the borders are kind of fixed at that point and haven't started to recede quite yet, but they will. Um, so this, the nature of the state shifts. It becomes a more bureaucratic state. Knowledge, paperwork, bureaucracy becomes quite important. The bureaucracy expands a lot. At the same time, there's a new actor, a new rival on the scene, and that is Russia, um, an Orthodox Christian power, right? So the circumstances outside the empire are shifting. The threats coming from the outside are shifting. The significance of the Balkans in that context and of Wallachia and Moldavia are shifting. The internal composition and hierarchy and sort of um, divisions in the empire are also shifting in the 18th century. So it is in that context that the Fenariates start to carve out first informal and personal spaces of influence and power. And then, um, as I argue in the book, toward the later um, decades of the 18th century and into the 19th, they really almost formalize um, this empire within an empire that people have talked about. Um, so who were the Fenariates? They're often, the term is often um, referred, the, people often refer to the term as meaning a, a small clique or a circle of families. Um, and there are like a handful of very prominent families uh, that were known as Fenariates. And the Sultan, you know, in Ottoman parlance, they refer to it as a takum, which is like a set or a clique, right? So it's the, the well-known families were, were few and at the top of this um, power structure. Um, underneath it was mercantile wealth and power that had been happening from before. Um, they had accumulated capital to then accumulate influence for um, clerical offices, lay offices surrounding the patriarchate. Um, so they were already kind of building influence there. There were particular localities that um, that some of these families were were from and retained connections to and kind of expanded this network. Hios, the island of Hios or Sakuz was um, one of the main early sites um, and that had been a Genoese uh, colony so there were already kind of connections to Italy for these um, these elites in Hios and they would send their sons to Italian cities um, for education, often for medical training to become physicians. In doing so, they would learn European languages. Um, they would then return and find relationships with viziers and the Sultan as physicians, and that physician relationship became an advisor kind of relationship. Um, and then it becomes kind of on a monumental scale with Alexander Mavrogordatos, who's Minister of the Secrets or Exaporiton of Köprülü Mehmet Pasha. So there is a direct, it's not just this broader restoration um, of the Köprülü viziers, the dynasty of Köprülü viziers, there's a very specific personal, there are personal connections, patronage connections that are created between these early Fenariates and specific members of the Kupralu dynasty. Um, and I put this here um, just because it's interesting to think about in this kind of Roman to Ottoman connection, are, are these turning, are these patricians or plebeians, right? The, the core kind of dilemma of this phenomenon for me and in the book is that um, how remarkable it is that they managed to accumulate and maintain such a degree of power and influence in a system where they had no official place. <laughs> there was no role that, there was no official institutional space or political administrative space for them. They created that and they, out of a kind of vernacular, these vernacular conditions of governance as we'll see, and then it says a lot about the logic of the Ottoman system in the 18th century, and they were not the only ones that had this happen, but their kind of de facto improvised roles that they started performing then became formalized. So we can see it in the, and I draw this comparison directly in the book, we can see it in the phenomenon of the Ayan, the um, kind of provincial notables and strong men that develop in the 18th century. We can see it in a very different way with the Janissaries who 
have evolved into something completely different from what they were designed to be in the early years of the empire. And they become a complex of different uh, political forces and in the guild, the world of the guild. So in economics, politics, administration, everything, they become this huge force out of an improvised system, out of an improvised um, uh, style of governance, let's say. So the Fenariots in that way were part and parcel of the larger trends and logic of Ottoman governance in the 18th century. So their ascendancy um, has some specific turning points and benchmarks. Um, 1711 would be um, <coughs> when the um, some of the key four offices were formalized for Fenariots in Ottoman governance. 1821, of course, being the outbreak of the Greek Revolution, which was not an end point, I would argue, but a very important turning point for the story of Fenariots. Um, so their ascendancy began, constituted um, four official offices of state. Um, two, again, there are many words for this because they operated in many different linguistic <laughs> milieu and sort of um, kind of political traditions all at the same time. We could call them princes. They were called princes by some um, of Wallachia and Moldavia, together known as the Danubian principalities. They were not those principalities were not um, within the core um, areas of the Ottoman Empire. They were north of the Danube. So they had a kind of tributary relationship with the Ottoman Empire. So they were semi-marginal, semi-autonomous, had been run by, let me put it this way, the um, Greek Orthodox, the Patriarchate, um, and the Greek Church had always been heavily involved in these areas through land holdings, monasteries, etc. The actual, um, individuals that held office and were farming the taxes and, and performing administration had been Romanian speaking boyars who were bound up with the church but were but had a separate indigenous kind of status. Um, this changed in 1710, 1711 and why is my <laughs> that's not okay. Um, when um, Dmitri Kantemir fled to Russia there this is Russia is on the rise there was a a conspiracy, uh, there was a war, and um, they betrayed, these local boyars betrayed the Ottomans. The Ottomans then decided to um, deputize the Fenariots from Istanbul with these offices, to entrust these offices to them. Okay, um, so they, it was the um, Principality of Wallachia based in Bucharest, the Principality of Moldavia based in Yash, Yasi, um, they were also called voivodas, hospodars. It depends if you're looking at the Slavic, you know, the, which which political context you're looking in in linguistic context. So they let's call them princes for now. Um, in Greek, it's igemones or hegemons, which shows a kind of Roman um, throwback. So there were two positions. There's a position in each of those at the top of these principalities. There was also two. There were also two dragoman positions. Dragomans, I know some people in this audience do not need the, to know the definition of dragomon because they already know it, but for those who need it, um, dragomon literally is means like a translator or interpreter. It was actually <laughs> something much more capacious. It was uh, almost a diplomat in his own right um, because in doing the interpreting, there was a lot of liberty taken and um, let's call it a negotiator, interpreter, intermediary, right? So there's the Grand Dragoman, who is located um, at the palace and is the assistant to the Reis Effendi, uh, who was the chief scribe. And again, this show, this reflects the bureaucratization of the empire. It's the, technically the chief scribe, but actually is evolving into a kind of quasi foreign minister. And it does become officially that in the later, in the 19th century. Um, so the Grand Dragoman is situated at the top, right, palace and state, um, and is um, the mediator between European states, at least, and, uh, and the Ottoman court. Now, there's also the dragoman of the fleet, which is a really kind of a fascinating position in and of itself that gets less attention in this whole Fenariot story. It's basically the vice admiral um, under, the, under the 
um, orders of the Kapudan Pasha or the Ottoman admiral. And it's the, the dragoman of the fleet was effectively governing the Aegean islands, um, which were, you know, largely Greek speaking and Greek Orthodox. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting kind of internal dragoman that was needed, right? Somebody needed to interpret and to mediate between the Kapudan Pasha, the Ottoman, and these populations who are <laughs> Greek Orthodox. So these four offices become the kind of um, hubs around which these Fenariot networks develop. Um, and what I show, and you know, there is no uh, agreed upon system for appointments, terms, term limits, checks and balances, none of that is going on. As Russia becomes more involved in Ottoman governance as the 18th century unfolds, um, they will try to impose um, more kinds of restrictions, regularity, control, of course, on their part, um, about who is getting these appointments and how long it's lasting for and what the privileges and obligations are associated with them, particularly the, the provincial, the Wallachia, the Danubian principalities appointments. Um, but in general, it's a kind of loose, it's a loose system and it, it ends up becoming certainly corrupt as far as we would define it because they were buying offices and there were constant, there was constant intrigue. Um, ceremony um, became more and more elaborate about investiture and traveling to the principalities. And by the time, by the time a, a prince would arrive in the principality after months of this elaborate um, march there with his whole retinue, um, back in Istanbul, something else had happened and he would have been taken down. And so um, there was a, certain times worse than others, there was a lot of turnover in these offices of state. So it was not a stable setup, but it was something. They were meeting um, some demands of governance, some very important demands of governance that were emerging in the 18th century due to all of these internal and external changes. Um, the ACME, what I would, is what I call it, is actually after 1774, the Treaty of Kichuk Kainarjo with Russia, which is a big turning point for the empire and for the um, Orthodox Christian inhabitants therein, um, they really do start to become <laughs> an empire within an empire. And when I, I think that when that term has been used in the past, there's a lot of assumptions that go with it that somehow it's a direct continuation of Byzantium that never went away and they've always been operating like this. Actually, I think there were a lot of changes in the meantime and that this empire within an empire is an Ottoman, Ottoman, which is always connected back to Byzantium, of course, but it is uh, a product, a creation of the conditions of 18th century governance in a unique way. Um, but they, so they are pretty much creating this empire within an empire. Again, there's a logic in Ottoman governance and bureaucracy at this point where um, you get, you, you, um, expand like even down to individual little provincial dragomans and, and um, low level clerks, right? You informally have servants or scribes um, and then so at some point they become formalized. And then once they're formalized, they never become deformalized, right? So the, the retinues of these Fenariot families and I call them households. They are, they are households and they start to refer to themselves as Hanedan or dynasties by the end of this period I'm talking about, the retinues keep growing <laughs> because the sons of the family are officially part of this household and then the sons have servants and they need secretaries and they need people to carry their water and they need, and so there's a, there's a replication kind of of, of sultanic <laughs> um, culture and imperial culture even within these Greek Orthodox Fenariot households. What does this mean? It means we're not talking about just five or 10 families and like a hundred people. We're talking about actually implications going further down into lower social strata, particular localities that are, um, that are being drawn from, that, that manpower and is being drawn from into these, um, into these networks that are, you know, they're gonna be based in the principalities and in Istanbul, but like I find evidence of members of these retinues, certainly from the islands, from, Sam from Hios, from Samos, and then from the Southern Balkans as well. Um, 
definitely there is a Hellenization going on. And I, the book is, the core of the book is a, is a biography of one of these Phenariates. And he happens to be a Phenariate that was not born Greek speaking. <laughs> he was born Greek Orthodox, um, but he was born into a Bulgarian speaking milieu and family. Um, and this is typical of the time that there were, um, you know, Bulgarian, Slavic speaking, um, uh, Vlach, definitely Vlach speaking, um, Romanian speaking Orthodox Christians that um, in order to become absorbed into this network, they become Hellenized, right? You can go to Greek school, learn Greek language, um, become, you know, take on Greek manners, let's say, of kind of urban, um, uh, you know, bourgeoisie, perhaps, and um, change your name to have a Greek name, a Greek variant of your name. Um, and so there are a lot of mechanisms of social mechanisms, upward mobility that are happening, driven by this Fenariot phenomenon at the top. Um, Boyars, there's a whole other story that <laughs> we could go into about what's happening with these local um, landowning elites in the Danubian principalities that are still there um, underneath this Fenariot layer um, and they're intermarrying and they're, you know, so there's, there's a lot of, of complex change happening in the 18th century. It's not just chaos <laughs> um, and corruption. And, it, you know, in the Greek, um, Greek terminology, this whole world that I'm describing to you in terms of like communal leadership and things pre tanzima is just called Yerondismos, right? The rule of the elders, as opposed to what would happen later when um, the lay elements and the um, sort of the, the guilds and the merchants and the bankers will get involved in the Greek community. This is kind of, it is a kind of um, old style <laughs> patrimonial, world that is happening. But change is happening within it. It does not mean that it's just one thing uh, in this pre-modern period. So 1774 to 1821, just giving you this kind of wide-angled sense of the developments that are happening and the expansion that's happening um, in this Fenariot house that I call it metaphorically. Um, some of the big names, obviously Mavro Gordatos, which was um, Alexander Mavrogordatos and Nicholas uh, were the first, they're the, kind of the forerunners. Um, and their, uh, you know, their kind of capital comes, their, their political capital comes, of course, from the Ottoman conquest of Crete in the late 1660s that they helped, they were working with the Kukurlu on that. And so that victory was um, sort of the cause for you know, bestowing different offices and giving more influence, giving the minister of the secrets title and things like that. So they, um, so they were bound up with the Ottoman central um, state apparatus, certainly. Um, and um, the Sutsos family, the Mavrogenis family, which in the book I go into this a little bit, Mavrogenis was a bit of a, an interloper or an outlier. He wasn't one of the initial um, elite families. So there were even, there was even room for kind of maverick, <laughs> um, maverick fenariates to come become part of this picture. Um, now, one thing I really want, wanted to get across in the book, and I think I have, is the extent to which this fenariate enterprise, this fenariate ascendancy, this fenariate house was remarkably integrated and engaged with Ottoman and Turkish Ottoman linguistic cultural pursuits, right? Uh, the intellectual world, let's say. This is one example. This is called, uh, art historians call this the Kaminar map. Um, it's from 1812 in Istanbul and it's blurry. Um, if I could zoom in and it were clear, you could see that it's all in Ottoman. It's very much an Ottoman. <laughs> to me, it's a very much Ottoman map. There's like a little story off to the side about this one neighborhood. Um, it's like, it's kind of a fascinating map. Um, Kaminar was a title in the Danubian principal, in the, the kind of bureaucratic structure of church slash Danubian principalities. Um, and, you know, this Kaminar was an official in a Fenariad administration in 1812. And 1812, I show in the book, is, is kind of one of these, um, one of these moments when the system is crystallizing for these Fenariates. So this is one example of how uh, the extent to which Fenariates and even lower level Fenariates, not just the very top um, 
you know, very opulent, fancy families, but even the lower level um, officials were participating in Ottoman life, intellectual life and bureaucratic life. Um, this is another fascinating example. I mention it in passing in the book and um, since the book, because the book came out 10 years ago, a couple younger scholars have looked more closely into it and it's amazing, even more amazing than I thought, so I'm thrilled. Um, I call it a Nasihat Name uh, in the book, that's what it's cataloged as. A Nasihat Name is part of the, um, I guess we call it the mirrors for princes genre, right? The um, advice to rule to young rulers, right? About what what a good ruler is. Um, this copy that I found is from 1807. It was written. Um, it was commissioned by a fanariat by a Mavrogorlatos. It's in Ottoman, as you can see, heavily Persian Ottoman, in line with the genre. Um, it turns out it's a copy that was commissioned in 1807 of a work that was originally from 1730 um, that was commissioned and co-authored by one of the early Mavrogordatos um, men, uh, members of that, of that dynasty really. And it's amazing because it is taking the genre, the kind of Persian, <laughs> the Persian Turkish genre of Nasihat Name, which was made a lot of in Ottoman historiography because in the 16th, late 16th century, there was a flurry of these Nasihat Name, namely the book written by Cornel Fleischer about Mustafa Ali wrote these uh, Nasihat Name to comment on the decline of the empire, right? And on uh, the way that, you know, rulers aren't good rulers anymore. This, so this genre was important in the Ottoman uh, world. Um, now, what is it being turned into in the, let's say, 1730 um, innovative edition? It's actually a language primer. <laughs> so it's a it's a it's kind of a language textbook and an advice to princes text all at the same time in a Christian milieu. So it's adapting this Persian Turkish genre into this fanariat Christian milieu. It's broken down into 12 books, 12 chapters, and it says in the introduction, that is because of the 12 apostles, right? So it's it's actually integrating in fascinating ways a kind of Christian intellectual milieu into this or synthesizing it together with um, this Persian Turkish milieu. Um, it's worth a whole study in itself, and I hope someone does that. Um, but for now, it just reinforces what I'm trying to convey that the fanariots were deeply engaged and struggling to articulate <laughs> their role and their place in this Ottoman system. In addition to all of the, you know, the same Mavrogorvatos is also writing really sophisticated tracts in Greek that are drawing on Cicero and drawing on, you know, um, Hellenistic thinkers. And so they are, they are really heirs to several different traditions and they are trying to synthesize them. The Ottoman dimension is what I am trying to draw attention to because I think that has been the least, um, it has been given the least attention, but we have these glimpses onto the fact that it was there from the beginning. 1730 is the relative beginning of this Fenariot ascendancy. Um, just to give you a sense of their built environment, I guess. I showed you, I talked about their houses back in Fanar in Istanbul. Um, they also, when they stepped into the shoes of these Romanian boyars as princes, um, they took over the palace. <laughs> um, there was an old palace. It's in ruins. I think both palaces, the, the new one, the new one was burned, um, I think in the 1820s. So I don't think there's much of anything left in the new one. But this was the old one, which had been built by the Romanian indigenous boyars, but at least we can get a sense of what it was. Um, so yeah, 16th to late 18th century was the old one and the Fenariots were, had inhabited that. Inhabited that. Um, and then the, it's interesting in the late 18th century, which is what I am arguing is their acme, they built a new palace that was ephemeral. It, was destroyed a few decades later, but it was there at one time. So this is the old, these are the ruins of the old one. Um, this is another great example, which I have a photo of it in the book as well. Um, this is the front kind of fountain and gate area of the St. Spiridon Hospital in Yash or Yasi in Moldavia, um, built in 1765. And you can see there is a Greek 
um, inscription and an Ottoman inscription underneath it, um, and the kind of coat of arms up here. So this is also just a nice um, visual representation of what they were trying to do and what this Fenariot uh, phenomenon was. Um, this is the Stavropolios church in Bucharest, uh, built 1724, again, that early period where this original Nasihat Nami was from Nicholas Mavrogordatos. Um, and you can see certainly Byzantine influence. I mean, I'm not an architectural historian, but I can see, you know, Byzantine and Ottoman influences. There's a little cemetery within. And I, again, I have a picture of one of the tombstones um, in my book and it's, it's Greek, but the, the shape and the style of it feels very Ottoman at the same time. And so you can see, you start to wonder how separate these things are anyway, Byzantine and Ottoman. Um, they're being synthesized and in some ways it's, I don't want to say effortless, but there are, uh, up to a certain extent, it makes sense, the synthesis, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, and that's still standing and it's beautiful. Um, Ceausescu, I believe, um, destroyed a lot of the remnants of 18th century, early 19th century architecture in Bucharest. Um, he kind of forgot about Yash though, because it was uh, a bit remote and provincial. So there are a lot more things to see in Yash, but this is one of the, one of the few preserved structures within Bucharest now. Um, this is another, um, this is fascinating. This is the Han uh, or the, what do you call a Han? Not an inn, but it's like a, work, it's a market, I guess, in a way, um, so a series of workshops of, and it's called the Manuk Bay Han in Bucharest. Um, Manuk Bay was Armenian, as you can tell from the name, um, and he was the Saraf, he was the kind of accountant, moneylender for these Fenariots, and he was also connected to um, an important faction of Ottoman military and statesmen in the late 18th, early 19th century. And so this was his Han. He ended up fleeing um, to Moldova, I believe. Um, long story, but this is also just to show you that this Fenariot enterprise, this empire within an empire, it also absorbed Armenians into it. They had a whole, they had a, a whole little bureaucracy and a whole little empire unto themselves, which overlaps because obviously the Ottomans too, many of the Sarafs were Armenian. So the crossover is noteworthy. Um, now, in terms of the changes that were happening on the eve of 1821. So right now I've sort of introduced the Fenariots. I've shown you how they had this kind of um, <laughs> a slow burn, like a sort of slow ascent in the earlier mid 18th century. It accelerates in the late 18th century. It's kind of reaching this crescendo in the 1810s. Um, some of the things that are happening, um, Ioannis Karadzas or Karaja and Scarlatos Kalimahi, um, both, they're ruling the principalities um, in these late 18 teens, and they both create law codes. Um, so there are, okay, so, the, so this is, um, these are two of the main characters in this lead up to 1821, right? Um, the first, I mean, what evidence do we have from these moments that we can start to put a picture together of what was happening in maybe what would have happened if the Greek Revolution hadn't broken out at that moment, who knows. But what was happening and what the context was, we have Thomas Hope's Anastasios, the novel that I read from um, at the beginning. And that is a quite detailed, <laughs> like a sociology really of what was going on at that moment in time. Um, and it's fascinating. It has a whole section on Mavrogiannis, which I draw on in the book. Um, there is a three volume work that I use extensively in the book by Dionysios Fotinos, um, who was a mid-level Fenariot functionary in the principalities. And he has, um, it's a history, it's called the history of old Vakdesha, which was the Roman delineation of that area. And it is really fascinating because it's not the Greek national story, of course, it's in Greek. <laughs> and in the later volumes, he is, he's not just drawing on 
old chronicles about what happened, he is telling us as an eyewitness what has happened in Istanbul, in Ottoman politics and conflicts, in the principalities. We get this incredible window onto what the world looked like through the point of, through the lens of a mid-level Fenariot functionary in 1819, which to those of you who know about the history of the Greek national movement and the Greek War of Independence, the Felikia Teria, the Society of Friends, which was the secret society that would launch the initial rebellions had already been created. It was trying to expand. It was this moment when a lot of things were going on under the surface. And here we get this worldview of that moment. So fascinating source. Um, and then the civil, the law codes I just started to talk about a moment ago, Kalimahi and Karadza, 1817, 1818, they were, um, clearly very influenced by Napoleon, who had just been through there. Um, <laughs> and they were creating these secular civil law codes at that moment, which is another fascinating phenomenon that was going on. What am I saying? There's a kind of uh, institutionalization that is happening just before 1821 of this world. Um, and some of the most fascinating evidence I've found for it, and, and I discuss this in the book, is this Kanuname, this regulation that has been completely buried by, I don't know, national history or something. Um, and it's the Hanadana Arba, which is the dynasty of four. It was called the Tetrarchy in Greek, which again gives us an idea that they have the Roman Empire in mind because there was a Tetrarchy in the Roman Empire, right? So this was a Ottoman <laughs> regulation in Ottoman, signed in Ottoman by all of the guys in these retinues. Um, specifying four families that from now on, from 1819 on, are going to have sole um, access to the four high offices that I outlined at the beginning, the two princes of the principalities and the two dragoman ships. Um, and they name which ones they are, um, the household of the three brothers of the uh, deceased Alexander Muruzis, um, the, um, sorry, the prince of Wallachia Scarlatos Kalimachis, Alexander Sutsos, Michalaki Sutsos, Drakozade, a different branch of the Sutsos family, and the household of these three brothers of the deceased Alexander Muruzis. Though, and this is the, how systematized it was becoming with Russian involvement, of course, that those who were named as excluded from this tetrarchy, meaning those families that are Fenariots and had been um, availing themselves of these offices, but would no longer be able to, would be provided with pensions paid for by the four households that were part of the Tetrarchy. So they would be compensated basically for their exclusion. And those would be the households of Yakovaki Argyropoulos and Hanseris. Um, what does this mean? One thing it means is that this was becoming a system. It was heading toward a kind of regularization, almost a rationalization and establishment of stable and formal dynasties. They're called Hanedan, which is the Persian Ottoman word for dynasty. The Ottoman dynasty itself is called a Hanidan. So we can start to see the extent to which these Fenariots were starting to be incorporated in, still with no official institutional place for themselves in an Islamic state where Christians were not supposed to be <laughs> part of the Oscardi ruling class. They were supposed to be in the Riaya, right, in the flock of tax-paying subjects. So it is rather remarkable that at this moment they managed to achieve that. Um, obviously, the ecumenical patriarchate is um, the <coughs> the elephant in the room, the hub, the institution around which these households in the Fanar quarter were developed. Um, and the basis for their legitimacy was their association with this um, and their um, activities in mediating relationships between the patriarchate and the Ottoman state. There were offices within the patriarchate like the Logothetis, um, which operated kind of like a dragoman um, within the patriarchate toward the Ottoman state. So a lot of, again, a lot of vernacular operations of governance were happening and kind of institutions that had been created long ago were <coughs> morphing, for a better word, into something else because of the conditions of governance. Um, I can, <coughs> let's see, how is our time? Oh my. Um, I did have, okay, let me, oh, I had please, a- Please, please, please keep going. Don't stop because of us. 
<laughs> oh, really? Okay, this is a very, this audience very has a lot of fortitude, clearly. Okay, um, because um, basically what I wanted to do, I wanted to read a short passage about, because now we're at 1821, before I get to the material about Volgaridis himself, which is the, the biography that the book tells, um, it, that will kind of give you a, closer to the ground idea <laughs> of what all this meant in reality and how one navigated through it. I wanted to read a little bit about what 1821 looked like in Istanbul for Fenariots, um, which is quite eye-opening, I think, <laughs> because it obviously, it was not the theater of the revolution. The first um, episodes, the first theater of, of rebellion was up in, in Moldavia, actually, which is another thing that is forgotten in Greece and that it's now gotten touched on in a few different events that I've been part of and people are really surprised and interested because obviously the Greek revolution ended up being based in the Peloponnese and in the nearby islands and that was the main um, stage and the main, you know, obviously the, the the territory of the first Greek state once they finally achieved it in the late 1820s. So the fact that it started in Moldavia, it's this Fenariot story that has been erased, but actually it started up there. And some of the people who initiated it were Fenariots. Alexander Ypsilantis had been a Fenariot. It was a Fenariot family. He had escaped to Russia and he came back across thinking that somehow, thinking that the Romanian peasants would support them, which they didn't because they hated Canariots, but that was, so that didn't go well, but it was the first theater of conflict. Um, so in the book, I have a whole section called The Unraveling, and it's, it's too long to read the whole section here, but I thought I would just read a couple um, kind of vivid moments so that you understand. It was, it was really a bloodbath in Istanbul for the um, Orthodox Christians. And it's something that I myself, even having written this book and spent so many years thinking about it, I don't, I haven't fully <laughs> processed what that must, all the churches were burned. So all the churches you see in Istanbul are from after 1821, they were rebuilt, um, just as an example. Um, so I'll just I'll just read bits and pieces of this of this section because I do think it's very um, vivid. So the unraveling on February twenty I use eyewitness accounts um, Greek eyewitness accounts that were kind of ignored until now really and and they they have turned out to be quite um, faithful because I've since found Ottoman documents that match up with this story so it is. Um, quite reliable, I think. Um, on February 28th, 1821, news from the Danubian port town of Galazzi reached Istanbul through the port of Ibrahim that, quote, the Greeks had risen up against the Turks and killed many of them. The first reaction of the central state was to summon the Kapukyahyas, who were the resident representatives of the Moldavian voivoda, or prince, in Istanbul. The oldest of the representatives was Nicholas, the brother of the recently deceased Wallachian voivoda Michael Sutso. The exchange that went on between the Reis Effendi and the Kapakyahya conveys the confusion of the moment. The Reis Effendi asks the Kapakyahya, hasn't your master written to you about the events in Galazzi? To which the Kapakyahya replied, no, he hasn't written us at all. When told the news by the Reis Effendi that the Gyaur, or infidels of Galazzi, had murdered the Turks there, the Kapakyahya again replied innocently that it must have been the outcome of, quote, the fights that break out between them, Rum and Turks, over women. His assistant Kapakyahya has likewise evaded the question, whether out of ignorance or fear, saying, Galazzi is the port of Moldavia. Aren't the Turks there Sambuliots anyway, who only travel there with their boats and load up with grain? With that, they left the meeting with the Reis Effendi and went to their homes on the Bosphorus. Um, <clears throat> they then found out there was a war with Russia also, and that's how they perceived it. And they left immediately and boarded boats bound for Odessa, which would become a safe haven for these um, <clears throat> Orthodox Christian Ottoman subjects. Um, I'll skip ahead a little bit. At this point, the state authorities, quote, in great fear that they were entering a war, looked to Russia and called in Minister Stroganov, the Russian representative in Istanbul. They asked him, why did Russia enter our lands? Um, he replies that he has no news of any war or incursion. Why did Russia let Ypsilanti enter our lands then, they ask. Stroganov answers, he's an apostate, not someone sent by Russia. And besides, Russia has no need of such means for we have a million bayonets to fight any enemy. Okay, so now they're thinking it's an internal conflict but they can't figure out <laughs> who is to blame and where to go to, to stop it. Um, there's no declared enemy or no representative of such an enemy within easy reach of the capital. 
After failing to pinpoint the cause or agent uh, of the distant conflict, the central state, lacking access to swift and coordinated military force, turned to mobilizing the Muslim population with the Ferman um, uh, by the Sultan to the populace that said, quote, Muslims, in the month of April, when the Gyavur, or infidels, have their Easter, they have conspired on that day to set fire to Asia, across from Byzantium, the old city quarter of Istanbul, the site known as Chrysopolis, Chrysopolis um, planning that we will cross the straits to put out the fire, Uskidar, basically, I think it's Chrysopolis, planning that we will cross the straits to put out the fire. At that moment, they will enter Byzantium and take the throne from us by sword. Cursed and excommunicated is he who violates my order. So arm yourselves immediately and be vigilant day and night. So they didn't make reference to the uprisings already underway in Moldavia or in the Peloponnesos, the Morea. Um, it was focused on a betrayal that was yet to happen, but was much more immediate because it was a plan that they believed to, to a conspiracy to take over the very seat of the empire, the seat of the Sultanate. Um, so I skipped forward a little more. Um, the quote, Turks went en masse to the bazaar, bought guns and ammunition and started shooting everywhere. Um, they, <clears throat> I'll skip through this part. Um, there was, anyway, um, there were public executions that happened in waves of suspected Christian co-conspirators. Um, the first day in mid-March saw 10 executions, and these, a lot of these are Fenariate names, Postelnik, uh, Nicholas Skanavi, um, his son-in-law, the Hatman, which is in a, a title, Michael, who had been dragoman of the fleet in 1815, the Grand Logothet, Logothetis of the Church, Theodoraki Jesus Nerulos, brother-in-law of Skanavi, who had been dragoman of the fleet. So basically what we're seeing in these, and it, it keeps going, these mass, these executions, we're seeing the kind of um, it, coming to the fore of what this Fenariate house constituted, like what was constituted, who was part of this Fenariate house and how the Ottoman state perceived this complex, which was only just starting to become formalized a couple of years before, right? But they're trying to figure out like who, who is in charge here and who is responsible for this. So it's not just the hanging of the patriarch on Easter Sunday. I have a whole section on that and it is actually very different from what we think it was. Um, so it's, I mean, I'd like to talk about what we're doing these two, so I'll spare you and hope that you buy the book and read the book to, to read this. But I go into quite a lot of detail about which clerics and which, um, <coughs> which laymen were executed and what order. And in fact, the um, hanging of the patriarch is really different because it turns out, according to this eyewitness account, that they had first removed Gregorios, the patriarch, from his position and installed the next patriarch because they were very aware of Russia watching them and they were not going to execute um, a patriarch while in office. So they executed the man who had been patriarch, um, which in the Greek national imagination is not at all uh, how the story is told. So that is worth discussion, I think. Um, <clears throat> so with that kind of... Um, apocalypse, I guess, <laughs> for the Greek Orthodox in Istanbul, I will now backtrack a little bit and tell the story as briefly as I can, because time is passing, um, uh, through the eyes of, through the case of Stephanos Wobridis, also known as Stefanaki Bey, um, who lived between 1770 and 1859, and he really um, is emblematic of a lot of these um, of a lot of these points that I've been trying to make in these features of this Fenariate ascendancy and, and the undoing and remaking of Fenariates after 1821. So he was born in Kotel or Kazanjuk in central Bulgaria now around 18, uh, 1770. And he was born as Staiko Stoikov, so Bulgarian through and through. Um, <clears throat> he was not just any Bulgarian speaking person in a small town. He was the grandson of Sofroni Vrachansky, who was a bishop, an archbishop, who had actually been invested with quite a lot of power in the chaos of the um, Kurjali rebellions in the Balkans uh, in the, the later 18th century. And he's also credited with being, it's fascinating because his own grandfather was credited with being the kind of um, pioneer of the Bulgarian cultural enlightenment. Um, and yet um, Stefan Eike identified often as a, as a Greek or as a Greek speaking Fenariate. It's 
complicated on that front too, because there's a Bulgarian component. But um, he didn't become a Bulgarian nationalist is the point. Um, whereas one might think that Bulgarian cultural revival two generations later would lead inevitably to Bulgarian nationalism, which it did. So um, he was in this milieu of Bulgarian speaking merchants. His dad was a merchant. Um, they were involved in some tax collection in the smaller town. They were um, close to Arbanasi, which is a town on the Danube, which is where a lot of these Fenariot families had their country homes because it was between Istanbul and the principalities and it was nice. And so they had these beautiful houses. So he spent some time there. They made some connections. He went to the Princely Academy of Bucharest, which is this Greek language, one of these Greek language academies um, founded by these, these Fenariot princes. And it was one of the vehicles for Hellenization. And indeed he became Hellenized there changed his name, Stefanos Vogoridis, instead of Stoiko Stoikov, um, <clears throat> learned Greek, made some important connections. Around 1795, he goes to Istanbul, um, <clears throat> again, with a kind of uncle patron to work under. And guess what? He goes to Egypt. He's already a kind of a low-level um, translator interpreter. He goes to Egypt in 1798-99, which I think we all know what happened then. So he was there for Napoleon's, like he was there for the battles of Abukir and the kind of world historical moment of Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. Um, and he was this kind of, you know, young up and coming Fenaria Dragomon. Um, he is the, he was the brother of um, Athanasios Bogoridis, who was a Greek nationalist and was a close friend of Adamandios Corais in Paris, for those of you who know the big, um, the Rousseau, I guess, of the Greek revolution. Um, he was, um, he became part of the retinue of Scarlatis, uh, Scarlatos Kalimachis, who's one of the, the one who did one of the law codes and one of these big fenariates of this period and married into that family to a, a woman who had descent from Hios. So again, he's garnering, all the kind of trappings of legitimacy and status as he rises up. Um, and he reaches the highest um, office that he can because he's not one of these four families that are the dynasties, but he reaches the position of Kaimakam of Moldavia, which is second in command after the prince as the Greek revolution is breaking out. <laughs> and he is seen as one of, he's seen as a special case we see now in Ottoman documents too, that they see him as an exceptional case of a Christian who is loyal and is dependable. And it's in this moment when, as I referred to this section in the book that like, they're like killing Christians left and right and they don't know who to trust. For some reason, he has achieved this status with them of like, he is exceptional. We're putting him in this office for our reasons and we're gonna trust him for now to keep everything together. Um, he um, then becomes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to, the, the whole book is built around an apology that he wrote in 1852. And the apology um, has a very detailed description of this moment when he was Kaimakam in Moldavia in 1821. But in order for you to understand the significance of that apology, I have to tell you what he then ended up doing between 1821 and for the next 30 years until the Crimean War breaks out in 1852-3. So he, um, in the midst of this Greek revolution, when he could easily have been a partisan, he could have, he, they wanted him to take part in it. He refused. He became a negotiator for the supply port with the Greek insurgents <laughs> in like 1825, in the, mid, in the midst of it, before Navarino. Um, he then stays loyal. He has a brief period of exile before that within Anatolia, and he comes back out to be the negotiator, one of the negotiators with them. He then weathers this broader crisis and transformation of Ottoman governance caused not just by the Greek revolution, but also by the abolishment of the Janissaries in 1826. Um, and the threat coming from Mehmet Ali, who is both friend and foe of the Sultan. Um, I argue in the book that this, all of these events in the 1820s operate, they, they basically precipitate a massive transformation, not just within Ottoman governance, but in the relationship between the Ottoman state and the great power states that are emerging in Europe and, and Russia. Um, and in that um, context, diplomacy is actually becoming more important than ever because the Europe, that basically the Ottoman, the existence of the Ottoman Empire has been saved and ensured by a new configuration of geopolitics and diplomacy, this Eastern question. Um, and in that context, 
<clears throat> diplomacy is more important than ever because that is like a core area of governance going forward. Guess what? The finariates or the ones that are left have skills that are more important than ever. So even though officially the Greek Orthodox, the finariates are shunted off to the side because they're not trusted and a new generation of Muslim statesmen and some Armenians are put into these offices of diplomacy and translation. This guy, <laughs> Stefanaki Bey, actually stays on behind the scenes as the foreign ministry is being built and is a very important figure. He is not only a favorite of the Sultan and Mustafa Rashid Pasha, he's a favorite of the person known as El Chibe, or I think this audience has heard of Stratford Canning, right, <laughs> who was kind of running the show at this moment in the Ottoman Empire. So he was conveniently located close to him. He then out of this, he was involved in the kind of um, after party negotiations of the Greek state, um, meaning the tr Treaty of London, the Conference of London uh, is where the, the creation of the Greek state was negotiated. But then there were all these other matters that had to be followed up on and resolved, like the exact border and like um, certain properties uh, in Greece that would be, you know, like reparations and kinds of things like that. And so he was actually a key person in those informal meetings in Istanbul that had to, that were resolving those kinds of, of things. Out of that, he got the position of the Prince of Samos, which was an autonomous polity that was created um, Samos took part in the Greek revolution, but was then left out of the settlement for the Greek state. And it was given a special status of autonomous principality. And he became the Prince of Samos from Istanbul. He never went there except once, which I can talk about if you're interested. Um, he was the Prince of Samos and he basically replicated in miniature the Fenariot um, glory in the Danubian principalities, but in Samos, which was, kind of hilarious actually but like so he he had this official title but other than that his influence and his power were very old school and unofficial and informal and semi-formal and all kinds of improvised things um he's an advisor to the foreign ministry through this whole period of like pre-tanzimat early tanzimat high tanzimat right and at the end of his life he dies in 1859 um, so just a couple of years before that, when he's a dinosaur, literally, um, he becomes the first Christian appointed to the High Council of State, um, which is, you know, a gesture in this Tanzimat Ottomanist mentality of integrating Christians. He's, of course, like <clears throat> a very trustworthy Christian who's not going to rock the boat in any way. But so that's why he's given this. But still, he's the first Christian in this. So he, he continues to have a place um, all the way into the Tanzimat period. Um, now, again, do we have, it's been, okay, uh, I'll take a few more minutes and just like kind of give you a summary of this apology because it's a text that kind of drives the whole book and I think it's very telling. Um, so he wrote, I call it an apology. It was a coded memo that I found in the Musuros archive in, in Athens. Um, and it is the form of it. It is effectively an apologia, right? It's, it's an apology. It's written in code, sent to his son-in-law, who was Kosaki Musuros Pasha, who was the Ottoman ambassador in London at that moment. So this shows you these neo fenariates a different batch, but an overlapping batch of Greek Orthodox Christians are still... <laughs> they're still occupying some pretty important offices um, in certainly in diplomacy. Um, so he's writing it to his son-in-law to pass on to the British. It's the eve of the Crimean War. It's the, oh, there's a typo, sorry about that. But there's um, the controversy in the Christian holy sites of Jerusalem and Bethlehem are heating up uh, between, uh, there's this dispute between the Latin Catholic and the Orthodox uh, monks and church about keys to the church of bethlehem and the holy sepulcher there's like specific places literally that they're fighting over and it's becoming a huge international blowout because the french are lining up on the side of the catholics and the russians are lining up on the side of the orthodox and the british are trying to figure it out and so he you can imagine the position that he is in he is defending the orthodox in this dispute because he's orthodox he's not going to defend the catholics but in doing so he was accused by everyone of being on the side of Russia because Russia was the big protector of the Orthodox. 
he did not want to be a Russophile. He was in fact always an Anglophile from the beginning to the end. <laughs> and he wanted to show that he was not in fact on the side of the Russians. So he writes this whole apology to try to explain and articulate how it's possible for someone to be an Orthodox Christian, loyal to the Ottoman Sultan, not on the side of Russia, in favor of reforms, but still a good Orthodox Christian. Okay, so it is, it is a, it's kind of amazing that he could try to put together this justification. Um, and, and I provide the apology of verbatim in translation in the book because it is, it's just an amazing, um, it, is a, it a, communicates in an incredibly detailed and vivid way. How, at least in 1852, how he thought he felt at this previous moment in 1821, but certainly how he felt in 1852, and what arguments he felt he needed to marshal, um, who he needed to claim identification with, and how he saw the whole situation in his epic, right? Um, so it is a, it's an extremely valuable text, and it's, it's long. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to explain the parts of it and explain the logic of it. Um, so he begins, you know, I think one of the things he would be accused of at that moment is that um, he's anti-enlightenment. The church, the Greek church was of course opposed to the Greek revolution. It was not so great on the enlightenment, right? And so he's gonna now have to explain that he is somehow enlightened even though he's an Orthodox Christian. So enlightened by the theory of the evangelical logos, right? He's enlightened by, the New Testament by the Bible, right? To render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Um, and he goes through and says, um, Jesus did not serve a Christian king. So Jesus, what better Christian is there than Jesus? So of course I can be a good Christian and I can serve a non-Christian king, namely the Ottoman Sultan, right? So he's already starting to create this justification and show He's going to show us how he has been faithful to what he says, the duties of his servitude, um, right, of his subjecthood in the Ottoman Empire. Um, and it's not for him to understand why he has been placed under Ottoman rule, right, under the rule of the Ottoman Sultan. So right? a very Christian, I mean, it's, this, he's not innovative in this, but it's interesting that he's invoking these things at this moment. He gives us the list of the trials that he has endured um, in his career, and all the times when he says he was thought to have been a Rumeliot and a Bulgarian descent, which is kind of fascinating because he is of Bulgarian descent, but he's like distancing himself from it. Um, <clears throat> some more typos, sorry. And he says, if he had had a tender and coddled upbringing like the Fenariots, and he's again now distancing himself from that, and most of the Ottoman ministers in Istanbul, so he is a self-made man, um, he did not have a tender and coddled upbringing, he would not have been able to endure all the dangers that he has. And particularly in 1821, when the revolution of the Greeks, and he calls them Greki, which is different from Hellenes and different from Rum, he's calling them Greki, when the revolution of the Greeks broke out, and quote, when I was invited by Ypsilantis and the other generals of the apostasy of the Greeks, Grecon, to collaborate with them, I remain steadfast in the duties of servitude. And he goes into great detail about this moment in 1821 when he was the Kaimakam of Moldavia and the heterists, again, oh gosh, lots of typos here, sorry. The heterists, meaning the Etheria, the, the Society of Friends, um, the heter, he doesn't call them the Greek revolutionaries, he doesn't call them the nationalists, he calls them the heterists, right? The heterists, the revolutionaries with Alexander Ypsilantis, who had been repelled back across the Pruth River by me, because he was the Kaimakam, so he was fighting against them, and the Janissaries, who had come supposedly to fight against these apostates, but were themselves in rebellion and were banging at my door to demand their grain rations and kill me. Um, and so he's explaining this dramatic moment and all of these threats swirling around him. And a trust is kind of a trope in these kinds of things, but still it seems to have really happened. At that point, a trusted friend showed up and whispered in my ear that there was a proposal from Russia offering him an official title and properties in Russia if he would flee Moldavia and abandon his position. So he's in this moment and he's invoking this because he's in a similar moment right now with Russia that like everyone's accusing him of conspiring with Russia. He has this offer from Russia. He could easily conspire with Russia and go to that side if he wants to, right? 
So this is the epilogue, you know, so, so he then says, tells us what went through his mind at that moment in 1821, in the midst of this chaos and these dilemmas, should he flee or should he stay? By his logic, if he fled, he would be giving a perfect pretext to the Ottomans and specifically to figures like Khaled Efendi, who was a big uh, figure at the time, known as the Christian slayer in Istanbul to execute many Christians. Okay, so he says, this is what went through his mind at that moment. So I, in a very agitated state, and he says, he puts the French in there in this coded Greek language memo, dans un moment si suprême, turned to the all-powerful God and said to myself that if divine providence had wanted to bring me into being as a Russian, then I would have been born in Russia. Since I was brought into being in Turkey, and he calls it Turkia, I would have a lot of explaining to do to God if by my flight, I became the occasion for the sublime port to cease trusting any Christian subjects. So he feels a kind of paternal, <laughs> paternalist uh, responsibility toward his Christian flock in the Ottoman Empire as this kind of sort of fenariot, not Bulgarian, not Rumeliot. What is he? We don't know, but he has some sense of responsibility <laughs> and the duties of his servitude. Um, and then I thought this audience would appreciate how he concludes this whole apologia, because it is addressed to the British after all. So he says, the Duke of Wellington, who had recently died uh, before he wrote this, I think, what would the Duke of Wellington which we may recall the Duke of Wellington was an Irishman who served the British, right? Which is kind of interesting. He sees some kind of connection there to his own situation. What would the Duke of Wellington, if he were in my place, if he were serving an anti-Christian ethnos who looked askance at the loyalty of a Christian, what would he do? Would he flee or would he remain steadfast in his duties? Um, I've told you a lot. <laughs> Um, I am happy to, I mean, I have this whole other little section about why this whole topic is important going forward when we think about, well, what's going to be commemorated next year, which is the centenary of 1922 and the kind of <clears throat> Asia Minor catastrophe and all of that, which we can talk about in the Q&A if you guys are interested, but I think I've given you more than enough um, information and ideas to think about. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank, th thank you. That was an absolutely marvelous uh, presentation, <laughs> one that covers so much that is so totally <laughs> fundamental for modern Turkish history. So we're, 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 we're deeply, we're deeply indebted to you. So please, everybody, uh, th think about your, your, your questions. Um, but if I could just um, uh, ask very, very briefly, the, the, um, in none of the story do the do, 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 do the Venetians uh, appear, or, and, and I'm and I'm wondering whether that's simply because they'd lost so much power by then, or do, do do they somehow sneak in somewhere into your researches? That is a great question. So the Venetians um, technically exist until 1797. Um, they exist. They come into play when we're talking about the. Um, Heptanetian Islands, and then, of course, after 1797, that becomes the Heptanetian Republic. Um, they don't come, it's interesting that there are a lot of groups that don't come into the picture, as I was reading all of these sources about the Fenariots, Ali Pasha doesn't come into the picture. Hmm. Serbia very little comes into the picture. The Venetians do not come into the picture. I think because the extent to which the Venetians were involved at this point was really just commerce or there were some, like I have run into like um, documents about like Croatian and Zakynthian sailors that were under Venetian papers, right? And they're making trouble in Smyrna in 1796. You know, there's like that kind of stuff. Like there's some unruly elements, but Ven Venice I think at this point is not um, organized or powerful enough to be like exerting any pot, like, active influence. I think there are like remnants of Venetian power and subjects and connections that are there. That's, it would be a diffuse presence, I think. That's the best answer I can get. No, no, thank you very much. Well, that, 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 that sets it beautifully in context. Well, who would like to ask a question, please? Uh, please, please just jump in and we can kind of, uh, Celia, please. Uh, nice to see you. Please, please go ahead. <laughs> Hello. Oh, you're muted at the moment, muted. but you're surely you'll be unmuted in a moment. <laughs> 
Um, or does Craig have to unmute you? Um, I think I've done it myself, haven't I? Have yes, I done you have now. Yes, yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I wondered if, if, if Christine would be so kind as to tell us um, to what extent, if any, um, there was participation of the Fanariots in the Greek Revolution. I mean, it, you've dwelt, dwelt very strongly on, on one who, who stood out against it, but I'm what, yes. were there any other families or individuals who did play an important part? Oh, definitely, definitely. And that's why um, in the context of these <coughs> discussions going on in Greece this year, it's interesting because they, they see these Fanariots as, as, like I said in the beginning, as people, as a faction within this early Greek state and in the leadership of the, the Greek revolution that was, um, you know, uh, dodgy at best, I guess, secretive, um, but there were many. So Alexander Ypsilantis, of course, is one of the leaders. The Mavro Gordatos family was, um, was definitely part of it and was, were the leaders, some of the leaders in this early Greek kingdom. Um, the Negris, there were a lot of families that were kind of split. I did write a paper that was sort of a byproduct of this book about the different families and where they all ended up. And a lot of them ended up in Europe, in Germany and Russia and wherever else. So, so all, so a lot of them opted away from either Ottoman or Greek um, <laughs> association after 1821, but a lot of them certainly, the Soutsos, members of the Soutsos family um, were part of that early Greek, and a lot of streets in Athens are named after some of these families. So certainly uh, many of them did, but it's interesting to then trace who the neo Fanariots are and which of those families were a continuity from before and which of them were kind of these mid-level families that stayed around and then ascended after in the new circumstances. Like the Cater Theodoris family who, you know, became, you know, several of the siblings were, one of them was a very like world famous mathematician trained in Germany, but one of them was the representative of the Ottomans at the Congress of Berlin. Um, mm -hmm. And then down to the very end, you see it, um, you can see it in like the list of who were the princes of Samos, because it was always an absentee, it was always kind of a sinecure, so they were never in Samos, they were always in Istanbul and somewhere else, but but you can see that all the way down to 1912, there are some of these kind of neo fanariots that have these pretensions to that, that older culture, but yeah, definitely there were many that were in Greece. And who would actually have, have um, physically migrated to the Peloponnese or to Athens to take part in, in the revolution? Yes, and that um, that becomes a big uh, fissure in in the early Greeks in the, the revolution and in the first decades of the Greek state. There's the one of the first controversies is um, that about eligibility for civil service um, in the Greek state, and and they um, delineate between autochthons, those who were in what became the Greek state before it was the Greek state and heterochthons who were born elsewhere and came in. And of course the Phanariots are among the heterochthons. And so they're already othered. There's already a kind of internal othering that's happening there, but they definitely have migrated. Yeah, exactly. They migrate to Peloponnese and Athens. Yeah, thank you. That was a great thank you very much. Hmm. David, can I ask a question? Thank you. Um, Christine, thank you so much for that. That was fascinating. Um, my question is slightly sort of tangential, but I was wondering whether there's any sense in which the um, room populations in, in Anatolia, elsewhere in Anatolia, in Smyrna, in Cappadocia, in Pontus, for example, yeah. play into this story, either in terms of the support that they offer the um, Fenariots or in terms of their social and cultural links with the Fenariots. Yes, um, another great question. And I think that it's a separate story. I do think that these Fanariots, at least the ones that I've found evidence of, are very much Balkan, some Aegean islands, not even really the coast of, of Anatolia, Asia Minor. And the, the Karamanlu, the Cappadocians, and the Pondians come into play later. I'm now working on Ottoman census registers, actually, of the room, and I'm seeing, <clears throat> I'm seeing, it's fascinating, I'm seeing evidence of waves of migration from those areas after, like, 1821 and after, and so I think to a certain extent those were different, those were different networks and perhaps more localized, um, but I, I definitely see a Balkan into Moldavia, Wallachia Islands, Istanbul kind of orientation, let's say. Um, so yeah, that's, Thank that's you. a great question. Thank yeah. you.
Thank you. Mm. Any more, more more questions, please? Go go ahead. Um, well, well, just whilst you're, you're thinking um, about that, I mean, the, the other fascinating thing is how quickly, at least for a while, the Greeks, as it were, recovered. Because Osman Hamdi Bey, of course, drawing fully on his Greek background, became more or less in control of Ottoman heritage policy. Yes. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. And Hios, yeah. I mean, I even, the, my, the book that I just came out with this year, which is on a seemingly entirely different topic, <laughs> um, it traces the biography of a Turk, um, <clears throat> Rafi Khalid Karai, who lived from 1888 to 1965. And what do I find out? As I'm finishing the book, I stumble onto the fact that he had a grandparent who was a Hios, a, a Greek from Hios. Um, so yeah, there, that Hio story is amazing because in 1821-22, when the, the massacres happened, a lot of them were taken into slavery, converted, Osman Hamdi being one. There are lots of stories of what happens to, to those Hio Greeks after that point. And that, like to trace that kind of diaspora or that forced integration into the Ottoman system would be, would be fascinating, given that they were also such an important island in the making of the Fenariots, right? It's, uh, mm -hmm. And the islands around it were not, I mean, Samos, totally insignificant, a poor island of brigands and pirates and peasants that were barely subsisting. Mytilini, Lesbos, I mean, I guess a little wealthier, but not anywhere near the kind of significance that Hios had. Um, so yeah, it's a great mm -hmm. question. Yes, yes. And you, you said that you would like to talk a little bit more about, about the fact that the Prince of Samos never went to Samos. Oh, yes. He, <laughs> it's hilarious. Actually, so he named Vathi, which is the main port city. And well, there are a bunch of cities and towns in Samos, but the, the kind of capital city of it, he, tried, he renamed it Stefanopoli after himself, first of all. And that one didn't really stick. It stuck for like the time that he was the prince, right? And um, he tried to visit once and he couldn't get off the boat because they basically started shooting at him. <laughs> he was not a very well-liked um, leader, I guess. And his, he would, his Musuros, so like Kostaki Musuros, who then became a very important statesman and a very, he was really a Renaissance man and an interesting figure. And in, when he was first, married off to Vogaridi's daughter, he was uh, the governor of Samos, like the in situ governor on behalf. So he was kind of like the Kaimakam of Samos, right? And he had to go, I have the records of this, he had to go to each of the 18 villages and negotiate personally with the headmen of those villages in order to like get some kind of agreement for them to pay taxes in any way, shape or form and like to do anything. And so it was like, it was a pretty, um, I mean, if you think about the, the massacre of Hios was precipitated by Samos. They were brigands that basically the Samians um, landed on Hios and, um, and like kind of um, uh, provoked uh, some kind of little rebellion. And that's what was the pretext or the occasion for the Ottomans to come in and massacre it. So Samos was like, it was a very, um, rugged uh, population. Um, so yeah, they were not very happy with uh, Bogardivis being their prince, I think. But he was very safe from the perspective of the great powers. And in fact, Samos was seen as a kind of precedent for the Mutasarifiya of Mount Lebanon later, um, because it was the same idea of like, okay, they shouldn't be under direct Ottoman sovereignty of the Sultan. There should be a Christian, there should be someone of their confession kind of in between the sultan and the population, but it shouldn't be someone from that area. It should be some kind of distance um, from the population and some association with the same confession, right? So this, the, the logic of the, in fact, they talked about it when they were setting up the Mutasarifiya. So they were thinking back to Samos as like a solution and it's under great power guarantee. And like, so it, it's interesting. It's, it seems like kind of a marginal case and it wasn't like a diverse, population the way Mount Lebanon was, but the, in the great power's mind, it was kind of a, a template that they could use. So. Well, <laughs> well <wonderful>. <laughs> who knew? <laughs> but, uh, but there's a question from Natasha. Natasha, would you like to ask your question live? If you unmute yourself, you're most welcome. <laughs> Are you able to unmute? Yes, hello. Oh, yeah. yes, go, go ahead. Uh, hi. Yes. And thank you for this very interesting lecture. Um, I always puzzled why they use the uh, diminutive form of the Christian name. Why are they were called Stefanaki, Yakovaki, etc. 
That's a great <laughs> question. Yeah, because it was a it was um, not a trope. It was a practice that was that was great. You know, I, I would guess that it was um, a way of belittling, right? I mean, you're not they're not equals. So these guys, they could be a Fendi. Um, they're not going to be a Pasha. They're not actually going to be of equal status of, of Muslim leaders, right? Mm-hmm. And so it was, I'm guessing, I don't have evidence that this is what was going on, but I'm guessing that that was a way to keep them in their place, right? That like, Yakovaki Effendi. So Effendi sounds powerful or something, sounds he's noteworthy, yeah. but he's still going to be mm. a little, he's still going to be infantilized in a way, right? Um, oh, okay. Because I don't think All the right. Armenian, I don't think the Armenian um, equivalent, like the Amiras and stuff, I don't think they were referred to in diminutive, except that like in Greek vernacular, the diminutive was used all the time too. So it might have been just kind of a vernacular practice that got carried over into Turkish too. Because yeah, I see that a yeah. lot in the, the census registers I'm reading. We get to see how people were actually referred to in practice and there's a lot of diminutive just for regular rise right. mm-hmm. so there's that okay thank you thank you thank you thank you is any any more any more uh, questions please did, did you want to ask anything Chida? um david i'm just listening to this i'm I, i'm uh it's wonderful i i don't know what to ask <laughs> I, 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 Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. There is so much there that I, uh, (laughs) not being um, a historian, you know, from the very start, um, I I didn't know a lot of that. I only knew a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh my God, I don't know history at all. But then who does? (laughs) in Turkey. <laughs> um, <laughs> on the street, it's um, well, I, you know. <laughs> I'm definitely shaking things up quite a bit in this but I mean like it's not it's not the standard account I think of how things I, have, I have been reading um, recently more and more uh, books like yours who um, are written by young scholars like yourself and um, it's just amazing. I'm learning so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but Ian, did you have a question? Yes, I was going to say uh, in answer to, to what, what at the very start, Christine, you mentioned that the that the Fenarius had rather very modest houses. I mean, you you, you walk around Fenarius and you see how modest these houses are. Yes. Um, and then, but but I, but I guess that ties in with using the diminutive and what you what the, the English traveller who wrote the novel, you know, they, yes. these, they were very modest in the streets. In their houses, they were weighed down with silks and goodness knows what. Yes. As soon as they stepped out into the streets, they obviously had to tone down their wealth. But, but what I wanted to say though is that it seems to be a case of, of okay, so we all know that um, the, you know your Ottoman elite would 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 speak uh, Turkish, Arabic, and Persian equally fluently. Yes. Um, but it seems that, and as you said, right up until 1912, and, the, and including the Congress of Berlin, you had the, dipl- the op- Ottoman diplomats were fanariots, and they, they basically controlled foreign policy. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you, as you said, in, in, in relation to the uh, um, uh, Nazi abnormals, they, they were intercultural, they, they, they operated between the Christians using the lingua franca, franca of, of Greek, but then yes. sort of writing their... Uh, their sort of you know king uh, king manuals in in a, in a Persian style. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that this this entire phenomenon is. Am, am I right in thinking this is all down to the, the the refusal of the of the Muslims, the Turks, to learn any language other than those <laughs> of their own culture of Turkish, Arabic, Persian? Well, we all know they were completely fluent in all those things. But in the case right. of Greek, there seems to be they were so utterly reliant. On this one yes. minority, the Greeks, not the Armenians, not the not the Venetians or Italians, yeah. not, not the Bulgarians, not the Serbians, but only yes. the Greeks. With this particular Christian, let's say Christian language, that's that is the, the conclusion I've drawn from this talk. A fantastic talk, of course. Let me just say Thank it was you. a magnificent talk. And I'm looking forward to reading the book. <laughs> but is is that your is that would you agree that this is all is all down to the rulers, unlike other imperial uh, uh, rulers? actually <laughs> not just re- refusing to learn this language yes. and therefore being so dependent on this one group 
Um, that's a great question. And it's not, I think it's even more complicated than what I've laid out to you today in that I recently read um, something that's in preparation by one of these younger scholars who's looking into this Nasihat Name and what he has found, I'm so excited about because it makes sense, but we don't have a lot of concrete evidence. But what he has found is that actually the Fenariots also needed this other group of Greek speaking Muslims from Crete, from Yanina, because as we know, uh, Crete, we have no evidence of large scale migration of Muslims to Crete after 1669. That is a convert. That's why the Turco Cretans were Greek speaking because they were converts. They were Greek Orthodox, Greek speaking Cretans that then became Muslim, continued to speak Greek. And he has found that um, the Nasihatname, for instance, he thinks that the author of that, together with Mavrokordatos, was one of these Muslims from Yanina uh, who was Greek speaking. And so they needed these guys too to, to perform a kind of sub dragoman role within their administration. And so what we, it really seems like it just gets more and more complicated the more we look into it. And that he's arguing that the Fenariots, they knew the Ottoman and to a certain extent Persian and Arabic, they knew it well enough to be the interpreters and everything. They never actually mastered it the way a Muslim would, would master those things. So that it was kind of a pragmatic knowledge of these languages and they relied on these Greek speaking Muslims to kind of supplement, to get them that extra mile in, in understanding the nuances of those languages. So that's one thing that's fascinating. Um, the other thing is, I mean, I guess, they weren't interested. I mean, if you weren't born a Greek speaking Muslim, it just would have seemed, I, I'm trying to think what it would be comparable to today, right? Like um, it didn't, I, I guess they didn't quite wake up to the reality of the practical significance of these European languages until it was, it was too late, but culturally it didn't offer them anything in their worldview. So it does make sense like in their world. It's just that, um, it put them at a great disadvantage as the 19th century <laughs> opened up, right? Um, so yes, that's great. It's a great question and I, I hope I've answered it satisfactorily. Yeah, yeah, but there's know, a lot about, more. No, I didn't know about the, 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 the you know, the, the Greek speaking Muslims. That's, that's another fascinating angle. It's, Thank you. It's, yeah. I know there's a lot more to be done actually. That's what, what I realized as I was reading this, this manuscript. So yeah, it's more coming soon, <laughs> more on that. <laughs> And the connection with Canning and the British here is so important because because between the Crimean War, of course, and the outbreak of the First World War, uh, mm -hmm. something had gone very, very badly wrong um, yes. with, with, with the British uh, position in, in, in Turkey. Please. Yes. I, well, I, I was just going to say, I, I mean, one of the other things he says in that same memorandum that is the apologia, he also has more like a policy brief in it. And at the end, he's he's basically saying, look, if the British don't continue to be the guarantors of this, these reforms, we're finished. Like, there's no way this, we're all goners, basically, if the British, so he believed very strongly in that capacity of the British to, to guide the reforms, which, you know, of course, is like a dirty thing to say now. It's like, oh, the colonialists and the, but like, he, he actually, he was a liberal, and he saw himself as a moderate against the fanaticism of nationalism, whatever else and that he really believed that the British were there to help much more so than the Russians right and so um he put a lot of stock in that and then his and then Musuros I don't I, I finished the book in the epilogue one of the things I mentioned is that Musuros retired shortly after 1878 right so as the British were severing relations with the Ottomans the whole situation the whole landscape was shifting at that point right and what does he do in retirement he translates Dante's Inferno <laughs> into Greek. And I think that that is a pretty significant choice because I think he sees, he sees what's unfolding and indeed the mass violence that unfolds in the Hamidian period and beyond, right? Um, and so I, I think that these guys, uh, a whole other dimension of this is that these guys had an incredible insight on history as it was happening because of their position, because of their, their education and their location in politics and in the empire. They had this kind of insider outsider insight and he saw quite clearly, I think what was about to go down um, in the empire now that the British had 
left <laughs> left town, so to speak. So absolutely, the, the the most important reason I think for the final loss of British influence in Turkey was the the fact that the that the modern Turks thought that we hadn't um, we hadn't exercised our duty as a guarantor in 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 with regard to the, the Cyprus problem, and that we mm. simply didn't want to get involved. And this is the this is the often stated reason that the, the British simply yet again let us down. Um, yeah. You know, so we had to take matters into our own hands. And, and it, you know, if, if if the Labour government in Britain at the time had actually been a bit more mm. forceful, perhaps this never would have been necessary. So it's a trope which actually continues almost to the end of the twentieth century mm. before yeah. it finally disappears. I think at that point. Um, That's fascinating because the very last image, the very last scene in the book in the epilogue is in 1955, when the pogrom against the Greeks of Istanbul is happening yes. in direct response to the Cyprus events, right? And they um, disinter the remains of Ogurivis and Musuros in that they're buried in the crypt of a church in Arnavike, and a mob comes in and actually disinters the remains and strews them all over the place, mm -hmm. having no idea that these guys were actually defending the empire for their whole career, right? They become a symbol of something completely different. So you're you're right to tie it to that to Cyprus and to you know it still goes on these conjunctures you know yeah yeah I mean, well that's that, that's equally valid people who attack statues really know really know much about the people behind <laughs> the statue uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, any, any, any more questions for our speaker please who's given us such a, a rich talk today um, uh, otherwise I think we just have to 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 to. to, to <laughs> To, to, to thank and Professor Filio for, for really what has been truly enlightening in the best sense of the word for all of us here, something we remember for a long time. So thank, thank, thank you so you. much for joining us um, and uh, we're the, the round of applause. And thank you very much. It was amazing. Thank you all. Thank you all. It's a pleasure and an honor. I hope to be back again sometime, sometime. <laughs> to, to attend your, att your events in the future too. That would be absolutely wonderful. So we'll, for, now, we'll just, for now, then, we'll just say simply good, good evening from London and hope you have a very nice day. Thank you. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.